Good day to you. Today is April 18th. And um, I think it's clear to everybody that the world in general and some countries in particular are in a monumental mess. The Ukraine, of course, hour to hour, things get worse and worse. And rather than talking about the Ukraine situation in detail today, I'd like to talk about the larger international context uh, in which this is happening and also the spin-offs of the um, Ukrainian situation. Um, one more comment on Ukraine. I agree with those who think that sooner or later, uh, the Russians will drop a small or use a small atomic weapon, uh, not because it's more necessarily more effective militarily, but I think they want to make they would want to make the point before anything uh, gets even semi settled in the Ukraine that they have these smaller nuclear weapons because the United States does not. And so I would be surprised if they wouldn't at some point want to put down a marker that we have these limited nuclear weapons and we're willing to use them. But anyway, this is all uh, speculation. But there are very sort of large questions afoot in the world today. As you know, there are close to 200 countries. And Presumptively, the fight in Ukraine is over democracy versus authoritarianism and autocracy on the Russian part. But um, let's examine uh, where the world stands on the democracy versus authoritarian issue. Uh, after the Second World War, of course, democracy was meant to be the wave of the future, right? Both in terms of the internal elections and governments and countries, as well as uh, the building of international institutions to manage uh, reasonable rules in very many fields. Um, then at the end of colonialism, uh, the idea was that the former colonies would all have elections and become democratic, and they all more or less had elections. And then after the Cold War, the idea was that now that the Soviet Union and communism was defeated, uh, democracy would be the wave of the future. Now you get to 2022, and it turns out that actually only a small number of countries, small groups of countries are actually democratic in any reasonable sense. Uh, most of the European countries, but even for example, Hungary, Mr. Orban, who just got reelected, um, is hardly um, a democratic country the way we conceive of it and learn about it in, in school. He is an autocrat, uh, there is no uh, the media is controlled by him. The election was controlled by him. So one would hardly offer Hungary as a model of democracy, even though Orban refers to Hungary as an illiberal democracy, like a new version of democracy. Uh, in terms of the rest of the world, there are, most countries have had elections. And the idea, of course, is that the elections, competitive elections, are the foundation of democracy. The problem is that first, many of the elections around the world, in Africa, in some in Latin America, in the Middle East, what are electing people either in non-democratic fashion, that is to say there's only one, one candidate, or the election is manipulated by the existing government, uh, or the counts are manipulated in one fashion or another. And so even though you could look around the world and say most countries in the world have had elections, democracy, as we tend to think of it, with you know, individual participation, rights, human rights, uh, legal systems that are you know, fair and free, uh, by now, by 2020, 22 are really a small minority of countries. Um, there are very few countries in the African continent of 50 odd countries. Uh, 
that have what we would consider functioning democracies. You look in Latin America, Central America, really democracies as one likes to conceive of them. Uh, then you look at Brazil, for example, it is hardly uh, a democracy in the, uh, in the way that a democracy and democratic governance was conceived of. So the number of countries that actually practice democracy nowadays have shrunk. And so you have more and more authoritarian governments, even those that have been, have been uh, elected. But even in the demo competitive democratic countries, for example, in Germany, in France, in England, in the United States, um, the manipulation of the electoral process and the government's role once the election have taken place uh, very often edges away from what would one normally would consider uh, democratic governance. Now, one of the patterns of the present is that um, governments, let's say, let's take two Asian countries, let's take India, right? The world's largest democracy. Uh, let's take Indonesia, very large country, big democratic elections. Both of those countries' leaders, Modi in the case of, of India, most of both of these countries' leaders, while democratically elected, are doing all kinds of things internal to the country which are hardly democratic. In the case of India, which is a good case, always a good case in point, the treatment of the Muslims, for example, uh, the um, in Kashmir, the Indian government just arrests people without trial and puts them in jail, or they get killed. Um, in um, uh, any number of ways, uh, the government of uh, Mr. Modi looks more and more that he's an autocrat, and that democracy as it was practiced after colonialism is slowly eroding in various ways. Uh, the same thing is happening in Indonesia. The same thing is happening uh, throughout the Middle East and, and Africa. Now, uh, who are the people who oppose um, uh, the democratic practices after an election. Let's even imagine it's a competitive election. Often it is not a competitive election. Who are the people that oppose the outcomes and therefore the transactions of those governments? Well, generally speaking, as we speak, they are populists on the right and on the left. So um, uh, they are, uh, let's say, let me take England, right? Our very good ally and democratic um, uh, country. Uh, all kinds of sort of semi creepy things are happening even in England, right? And one could argue that Brexit and the campaign for Brexit was a right wing populist activity and which succeeded to the detriment when many of us think of the future of the United Kingdom. Uh, the same thing could be said about the United States. That is to say, um, certainly we've had democratic elections, but the Trump administration's activities very often did not resemble what a practicing liberal democracy would look like, right? And we came very close because of January 6th of overthrowing the democratic processes, right? And as we speak again, uh, look at the United States, right? Supposedly we're the model of dem democracy in the world. And only about 30, 33% of the population is supporting Biden. And the support of the Republican party of Trump at the moment is still very strong. And not only is the support of Trump very strong, but for example, the Republican uh, National Committee has decided not to participate in debates. Uh, they claim debates have been set up hostile to them and so forth, and we don't need to get into that, but they've opted out as part of the democratic processes for an election. 
And even, even if one imagines that Trump may not be the next presidential candidate for the Republican Party, DeSantis and some others in the state governors are also doing a very good job of passing legislation which supports non-democratic processes, right? And some of these are sort of um, eccentric and esoteric. I mean, for example, all this business about uh, you know, you can, schools can't use the books dealing with the following subjects, which you no doubt uh, listen to on the news, both in Florida and in Texas and increasingly in other states. So there, the argument is that uh, governments need to come in to control, that is say autocratic governments control these things. On the other hand, the argument on um, populists, both right and left, is that they want less government, right? Therefore, the government should not tell us to get booster shots or to tell us to wear masks because that goes, or for that matter, any vaccination having to do with COVID because that goes against the principles. So there are contradictions built into this, both coming from the right and the left, which on the one hand say less government, and on the other hand are in favor of electing autocrats who reduce what we would have considered liberal democracy. And this is a worldwide phenomenon right now, as we are uh, moving into this century. And then the question really is, why are people in supposedly democratic countries so alienated from historically liberal democracies? Well, there are all kinds of explanations and I don't need to bore you with them. Some of them have to do with the inequality that has developed in the world with it. some very rich people and in general middle class and poor people have fared less well in countries. There's COVID and the psychological and political uh, reverberations from COVID. There are um, technological reasons, that is to say, uh, the fact that there are there's global media now. E Autocrats try and presidents try to curtail people's access, right? Uh, you notice this in Russia right now, but also many countries, uh, there is uh, very little freedom uh, in the media and then the, in the government media, and then in the private media, you can close them down and or private media is willing to propagate anti-democratic arguments and forces, for example, that the American election wasn't a fair election and that Trump really won and things of that sort. In the case of Russia right now, uh, it is uh, not, you know, Russia who is uh, bombing countries into the Stone Age or killing lots of people. This is all, you know, uh, Nazis in Ukraine and the Ukrainian government. You look at Maripol and where there's hardly anything standing anymore. And the arguments is that the Ukrainians have done this to themselves. It's not been Russian bombardments and so on. So the autocracies in both democratic and elected and non-democratic elected governments are pretty much uh, uh, channeling people's access to news and information. And then, um, you know, many people are not particularly interested in politics or what happens far from their homes or far from their own difficult situations. So then anything that anybody says uh, about another person or another country uh, tends to be believable. There is no critical, critical input. Now, why am I, you know, belaboring this point? I'm belaboring this point for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, the arguments are that in the case of Ukraine, the world should really all be rising up in the defense of the Ukraine and criticizing the Russians. Well, no, no such thing is happening. Then I say at least a third of the countries in the world, and therefore their populations and their media, uh, are representing uh, support for Russia uh, because this is a Western and United States attack against Russian interests. And people are buying that. They're buying that in Latin America, in Central America, even in fairly advanced, let's say, African countries like South Africa. South Africa in general is a support of Russia on this. So in some ways, 
um, the anti-Westernism and increasingly, of course, over the years, the anti-Americanism uh, encourages uh, people to say that, you know, um, Putin is doing the right thing, Modi is doing the right thing, uh, Aragon in Turkey is doing the right thing. Uh, people are protecting their populations and their interests against the West and against the American, American uh, leadership. And here it's worth also saying that American leadership, even in Europe, has declined. I mean, now, given the war and so forth, we're very prominent. But many uh, polls in various European countries show that the population, while it may support its own democratic elected government, is nevertheless fairly anti-American. And that's one of the things, of course, we don't as Americans realize, I mean, we still have this image of ourselves as, you know, the victor of the Cold War, the cultural leader, everyone listens to our music, wears jeans and so forth. And therefore, we are sort of the leader of Western liberal democracies. Well, hardly anybody believes this anymore. Uh, the countries ill disposed to the United States for one reason or another, of course, don't believe it. But even the publics in, um, in democratic and fairly liberal democratic countries like Western Europe don't particularly believe it anymore. And what makes Amer American attitudes and policies are most often uh, is sold as hypocritical, right? We lecture other people, but we ourselves are, are badly flawed as a democracy. Why are we badly flawed? Support of Trump, uh, various policies under Trump, uh, support of um, other people doing good things for refugees while the U.S., uh, is wanting in terms of its participation over the last few years in refugee crisis. Uh, we uh, criticize other countries for how they treat their refugees. For example, there's a current one that's sort of interesting. You might have noticed that uh, there are any number of refugees crossing the English Channel into England, and England doesn't want these asylum seekers, these refugees, and so it, it, instead of processing them as is appropriate under international law and post-World War II norms, if somebody arrives and asks for asylum, you're supposed to process them right there, here and there. But no, England is proposing, is beginning to send refugees from whatever, Syria, Afghanistan, um, Ukraine, to Rwanda, which is an East Central African country of all places. Now, Rwanda, you will recall, had genocide some years ago. And the government of Iran, you, Rwanda, I'm sorry, is hardly democratic. An autocrat is running Rwanda. So hapless people who have a right to have their asylum status under international law reviewed by England are now being put on airplanes, being sent to Rwanda, where they have no cultural, linguistic, historical ties, and where the circumstances are hardly welcoming and supportive of a bunch of foreigners coming from different countries. I mean, this is a nightmare for people, right? And this is happening. Well, American media has criticized this in the last few days. On the other hand, we've done similar things. Right. Uh, the Haitian refugees of some years ago, rather than allowing them to land in the United States, we sent them on their ships to Guantanamo of all places. Right. Not the base, but the but the location. Uh, I mean, we didn't imprison them like the like the 9-11 uh, prisoners, but nevertheless, we we've sent them. And um, for not too long ago, we refused asylum seekers to enter the United States to have their asylum uh, reviewed and told them they had to stay in Mexico until and get reviewed from there. So while we look as if we are, his, of course, historically welcoming to refugees and so forth, uh, the, we are not in a very good position to criticize other countries who are trying to divest themselves of the, uh, of the refugees. 
uh, because everybody can see that there is a hypocritical element to the United States. And I'm just giving you one illustration of why so many in the world who used to be friends and allies in the United States, and I just don't just mean governments, I mean citizens, and who looked up to us, uh, have for, for years now said, look, I mean, yes, it's democracy, but they have run down infrastructure. Uh, they have more people in prison per capita than any any industrial country. Uh, they, uh, you know, have poverty at a level uh, that's uh, mostly unheard of in our countries. Uh, they don't have early childhood care. They have all kinds of things which we thought would be, you know, they would be a role model for us all. When in fact, if you look more closely at the United States, you can see not only the racial discrimination, but all kinds of flaws in the United States. Now, as long as a country like the United States addresses its flaws, uh, it is, of course, viewed favorably. But, you know, some of these flaws were not addressed under the Trump administration and may not be addressed in the future. And so the luster has worn off. But as for the United States in the world, even for democratic, other democratic countries, as us being the sort of ideal role model to, uh, that needs to be emulated. So what do we have? We have unhappy citizens in democratic countries. Uh, and the unhappiness then manifests itself with a Marie Le Pen who could conceivably win the French election, which will be a nightmare, right? We can talk about that some other time. But you also have, uh, you know, all kinds of right wing and left wing persons who have agendas, but the agendas don't include what we would consider a vibrant liberal democracy where the state plays its role, where you have the rule of law, where you have some fairness and justice and, and all the rest. So that's, that's the democratic chunk. The non-democratic chunk of the world uh, is heavily influenced nowadays by both China and Russia. China is all over Latin America and over large parts of, of Africa, not to mention Asia, of course. And even Russia has its mitts in all kinds of Latin American countries, African countries, and, and so on. By having its mitts in, I want to sort of divide it into two. On the one hand, both China and Russia have interest in the natural resources of many countries for their own industrial uh, development and sustaining their, their industries. And so you make friendly deals with countries and give them loans and support uh, building infrastructure uh, in order to uh, assure yourself of access to these assets that you want, right? This is in the economic realm, and this is not particular just to the here and now. This has been going on for, for some period of time. In addition, uh, the Russians in particular have been busy uh, supporting um, guerrilla groups, uh, small groups of mercenaries in various countries, especially in West Africa, to either keep a government in power or undermine a government in, in power. And so they are of a military asset to the governments or the opposition in various, in, in various countries. Uh, you might recall in recent news that uh, there was an announcement that some of the mercenaries from the Wagner group uh, would be transferred from Africa and elsewhere uh, to uh, uh, the Russian efforts in the Ukraine. Ukraine. So they are part now of the Russian army. These are well-trained guerrilla type groupings, uh, nasty, engage, happy to engage in nasty illegal activities. Uh, but they're, but you know, they're military mercenaries. Um, it's of, it might just be of curious curiosity that you know why are these Russians called the Wagner Group. Well, the Wagner Group um, was founded by a guy who was a fan of Richard Wagner's operas of all things. So it's one of the sort of ironies, ironies in the world, the Wagner group, but they're Russians. 
Uh, and there are other funded, you know, mercenary groups of one kind or another uh, in the Middle East, in Africa, in increasingly in Central Latin America. Uh, and these country in the, in those places, uh, you have a whole chunk, maybe a third of the countries in the world that are assuming that whatever the West does is no good, you know, and that the United States is a menace to the world and that the Russians are probably right in looking out for their interest as the Western menace is getting closer and closer to, to Russia and are perfectly willing to believe that the Ukrainians brought this upon themselves and the various Russian propaganda is working effectively with the elites, uh, with the governments, and even in terms of the news and support that the general public is giving them. So we already have two chunks. We have the Western countries uh, that I talked about. Then we have maybe a third of the countries that are uh, well disposed to Russia in this conflict, and not just in Ukraine, but Russia's claim that the incursions of the West and NATO and so forth is threatening various, various countries. And the final third are groups of countries which for one reason or another, want to declare themselves neutral and not get involved. Uh, either getting involved is too costly because they have investments, let's say from the United States and Russia and they want to keep both, or they have investments from one or the other but don't want to take sides, or they have too much on their plate, they just want to stay out of a world affairs that's you know thousands of miles away. So rather than a, having a world which is all looking at the Russian behavior in the Ukraine and saying, this is really awful. What you have is two thirds of the world either not interested or inclined to support, be supportive of the Russians. And that I think comes as, as a surprise to us as Americans, because we think, you know, we're the good guys and the West Europeans are the good guys. And we are, um, Therefore, uh, uh, you know, pointing out the horrible things that the Russians are doing. Um, it's also the case that when you talk about, and I will in the future talk more about the international law and all the courts and all of that, but it's also the case that when we charge violations of human rights and war crimes, uh, and indeed the Russians are committing those, there's no question about that. Uh, but, you know, we're also not standing on a very high pedal because countries will point out and saying, look, look what happened in Syria, look what happened in Iraq, look what happened in Afghanistan. There were war crimes, right? Uh, there were innocent civilians that were being attacked and died. And so where are these Western countries standing on their high horse saying, well, you know, uh, the, the Russians are doing horrible things, which indeed they are, but then saying, you know, after all, the West also did horrible things. And that two wrongs don't make a right here. But on the other hand, one can see that the sort of uh, our disposition by our American disposition is that these, you know, the horrors of what the Russian soldiers are doing in Ukraine, the whole world should say, this is so horrible, Russia needs to be condemned. And some parts of the world are saying, yes, this is really horrible, but hey guys, the US has done some of this, right? So we have, um, you know, we're not looked at in a sense as being, you know, the, uh, the bringer of good, uh, good behavior, uh, even though many in the United States criticized our own behavior when we violated behavior. So in that sense, of course, we're a liberal democracy where we're able to criticize and people weren't thrown in jail and there was no censorship and, and so on. But uh, there is a kind of a duplicity uh, view, a view of American, you know, American duplicity. Now, one of the things that um, we don't have time to talk about today, but I do want to talk about the future is, of course, uh, the vast movements of people that are moving out of the Ukraine uh, and are getting, in many cases, in the case of Poland, some East European countries, hospitable welcomes, at least for the time being. And uh, 
On the other hand, students of politics will point out that sooner or later, uh, when foreigners move into fairly homogeneous countries, there then is a hostility to these foreigners, right? They're discriminated against. In England, Muslims are discriminated against. In France, Muslims are discriminated against. That's what produces hostility to immigration on the right wing. And to some extent, even on the left wing, but that's um, not true in France. The recent left wing candidate was pro-immigration. But in any event, uh, there is opposition of various kinds. And when people are uh, themselves doing poorly, suffering from COVID, uh, economic diversity in otherwise totally democratic countries, you then say, why are our governments spending money helping, helping these people? And the horrible thing that I've mentioned before is that the consequence of the Ukrainian war is not just these political and social consequences, but also that we're moving into an area of massive famine in many places in the world. Famine in Turkey, famine in, in uh, Egypt, famine in lots of countries that were 30, 40% dependent on Ukrainian-Russian grain, right? And the head of the World Food Program keeps pleading and saying, the world will see famine soon, something has to be done. Well, those circumstances also have an impact on the politics, right? Because if you're sitting in Egypt, for example, to, on whom do you blame the famine? Well, the war in the Ukraine, but you blame it on the West, having made incursions into the Russian sphere of interest, which is what the Russians are arguing, or do you blame Russia for having started this military conflict? It's not an easy um, and uncomplicated issue. And quite aside from the war producing hunger and famine, there is of course the parallel ongoing development of climate change, which is also sending tons of people out of their countries. We've talked about it before and I will talk about it again, but that means that most countries which were settled in the West and pretty democratic uh, and were trying to be charitable to victims of war and asylum seekers increasingly are not hospitable to them. The governments may still sound hospitable, but many people are not. And so the whole business of both wartime famine and climate change refugees, which will be by the millions in a decade or so, uh, leads to instability within countries. And instability within countries does not encourage liberal democracies. It encourages people at the extreme of politics who are saying, I've got the answer. And this is getting very, very, very dangerous. Finally, a last, and this is not a summary point, you probably have noticed that both Sweden and Finland, who are neutral, are thinking of joining the Western Alliance of, of, uh, of, of NATO. <coughs> Excuse me. And under the circumstances, uh, this is probably a good thing for the West. But the West, you know, many of these countries have, you know, very small populations. Europe, the Western Europe and Eastern Europe, which is in a more iffy situation for again, Hungary and, and Serbia, which are pro-Russian, right? Uh, is a small chunk of the world. And I would like us to think about the wider world and where the politics, not just of globalization, which is ongoing and I'll readdress some more because globalization parallels what we're talking about and also has an impact, but not only globalization and COVID and the war in Ukraine is raising very serious questions about the future of democracy in the century and the rise of autocrats and authoritarianism in many different places. And that is really quite scary or should be quite scary to all of us. Thank you for watching. Talk to you in two weeks.